Hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, the session. I'm Ritika, the lead for Future Cities at Ecolab Center of Innovation for Energy. And today we will be sharing our project journey on how we realized our hypothesis of reducing footprint and consumption patterns to sourcing technology solutions in the domain of energy, water, and shelter. Hence the title, Realities of Living Off-Grid. With me today is Chai Chin, who leads the technical aspect of the project, as well as the lead analyst for carbon management and circular economy vertical in Ecolabs. So to recap, uh, for any of you who haven't attended our previous sessions, uh, we are developing a civilization kit to focus on one person and the implication of reduced footprint and consumption patterns to an individual and how the community changes at large. The cons consumption patterns of one person are capped at 50% of their current state. So it is 20 square meters for space, 70 liters for water, and three kilowatt hours for uh, user behavior and consumption. So uh, the project is phased into a starter kit. And as the community grows and the requirements grow, we would add other layers as the intermediate and the advanced or specialized needs of the community through experimentation. Uh, to test phase one of the project, uh, we will be deploying three prototypes, which will house groups of volunteers staying in the space for two days, five days, and 28 days. The first iteration hopefully will be up by July 2020. And further on, we will expand this to phase two and phase three, as we had explained earlier. The three prototypes for phase one over the course of the coming months will be deployed at Jurong Innovation District to develop a modular self-sustaining shelter through an integrated systems approach. So let's get into the details or, and specifications of the system uh, that we are looking at for iteration one, which is energy, water, and shelter. The first one being shelter. Uh, this is a common image that comes to mind when we think of housing in Singapore. It's a very top-down approach, and there is no individual personality or flexibility in a unit configuration. So we thought, is it possible to create a functional unit which is still democratic, reflects individuality, and flexibility of form? So we had to pretty much go back to the basics of how much one person requires. Can we unitize and define the minimum order of space required for a single occupancy, a double unit, and a family in terms of bed space, storage, office space, circulation, and toilet space? So we came up with a social, uh, a spatial matrix. We isolated functions that can be shared or communal in terms of cooking and dining. And on a conceptual scale, we could look at a matrix where people could unitize or purchase space and shelter independently based on the value of that resource that they need or their requirement at that point of time. The freedom to orient your home or grow your home as, you, as and when you need it. Coming up, I'll be sharing two student projects uh, which summarize the idea of varying scales. The first one being transitory spaces where the students thought of fragmenting a house itself. So can we look at plug and play units for a kitchen, living and toilet space with the width of each unit based on the purchasing power or the need of the user at that point of time. The modular space can be individually produced, stacked and transported very quickly. Uh, the students explored ideas of 3D printing or using wood, sustainably sourced of course. So this is an, an idea of what they had uh, shared with us. The next one was a concept of mono, where the students use the philosophy of monotasking, minimalism, and Marie Kondo, so creating spaces that spark joy. The students took the idea of compartmentalizing to a whole new level, where they created an app to organize space and track the utility and function of each space. The self-sustaining unit would be a hybrid of water systems, energy systems, and compostable toilets. Uh, moving to the next systems, um, Chai Chen will be explaining the water and energy system. So over to you, Chai Chen. Okay. Uh, thanks, Ritika. Hello, I'm Chai Chen from Ecolab. So I'm currently leading the Circular Economy and Carbon Management Initiatives at Ecolab NTU. So I'll be talking about on the specification for the water energy system for projection. Okay, so this figure actually shows a typical centralized water system in the Singapore context whereby uh, water, natural sources like rainwater or seawater are first collected and then they actually being transported to the nearby waterworks for further treatment. 
These treatment processes include coagulation, sedimentation, filtration, disinfection, as well as bio and chemical uh, treatment processes. Later, all this water will be transported for public and industry use. So what are the challenges and also the main motivation to actually to get away from a centralized water system? First, a centralized water system could not supply a water to actually to decentralized or rural community. This, this is because such communities are usually uh, sited far away from any nearby water supply. In addition to that, uh, there's a lack of water circularity component in the in most common centralized water system. Yeah. Okay, uh, this figure actually shows the typical uh, water consumption patterns for a household in Singapore, whereby majority of the water consumption originate from shower, toilet flushing, kitchen uses, as well as laundry. So uh, for project here, our aim is to actually to halve the consumption from 140 litres of water to 7 litres of water by means of recycling or other water saving solutions. So uh, what are the requirements uh, specifically for project here in terms of for portable and non-portable users? So for non-portable users, we are looking at a grey water recycling system as well as a rainwater harvesting system. Whereas for portable users, which is for drinkable users, we are looking at uh, an atmospheric water generator, which can generate water from humid air. So uh, this figure actually shows the overall layout of the proposed decentralized water system. Firstly, what are the requirements for the rainwater collection or harvesting system? So based on Singapore Public Utility Board, as well as a National Environmental Agency, NEA, so the maximum volume water tank size is actually 20 cubic meter. And most, based on the most of the figures from uh, journal papers, uh, Singapore government agency, as well as uh, online sources, so typically a water collection, a real water collection system uses 0 0.8 to 2.3 kilo hour yeah, for every uh, per cubic meter of rainwater. Next, we are looking at the specification for the grey water collection and treatment system. So based on some uh, PUB stacks, uh, a grey water treatment system should actually treat at least 25 litres of grey water per day per person. And such system also should use around 0 0.9 kilowatt hour for every cubic metre of treated water. Yeah. So such system will actually use for non-portable users as well as toilet flushing. And last but not least is the atmospheric water generator. Uh, we are actually looking at yeah we are actually looking at a relative humidity of at least uh, forty five percent, and such a uh, generator uses around 0 0.5 to one kilowatt hour for every liter of water being generated. Okay, next I'll actually talk about the proposed energy system. So just to give you an insight, there actually there are two main kinds of uh, energy system. The left one actually represents a typical centralized or grid connected energy system. So during the day, solar panels as well as the electricity grid are the main sources of electricity to power your loads at home. Like for example, your TV, your refrigerator or air conditioning system. However, during at night, the solar panel will not absorb any energy from the sun. Hence, the electricity grid is the only supplier of electricity to power your loads. In comparison, uh, Projection is actually looking at a uh, decentralized or off-grid energy system, whereby during the day, the solar panel will actually absorb the solar energy and store some of this energy in the battery itself, whereas the rest of the absorbed energy will be used to power the AC and DC loads. However, during at night, the battery, the stored energy in the battery will be slowly distributed to actually power the AC and DC load at your home. So what are the challenges and constraints typically for a renewable power system? So this figure actually shows a typical um, power system that actually power using uh, solar panels, whereby if we actually consider the grid connected power system, which is actually shown uh, previously in, on the left for the left figure, such power system actually uh, undergo a lot of instability in terms of the frequency as well as the voltage. Secondly, it's actually the irregularity for solar, in solar production due to the change in weather, like cloudy or rainy days. 
Okay, this chart actually shows a typical um, electricity consumption pattern for households in Singapore. The majority of the consumption is actually from um, AC, aircon, uh, refrigeration, as well as high energy intensity electrical appliances. So what are, what, uh, does, what are the requirements for projection in terms of the energy system? First, we are looking at a compact battery pack that can be easily transported. Second is the use of renewables like solar or even wind energy. Next is actually a smart sensoring to be installed at all major electric appliances. And last but not least is an energy monitoring system. Okay, so this is actually an overview of the proposed decentralized energy system. During the day and night, you can see the flow of electricity between the solar panels as well as the battery. So we firstly, we actually need a solar panel of five kilowatt peak we actually account the efficiency losses. Secondly, it's a battery capacity of at least 20 kilowatt hour, and this battery should actually have a backup storage of for at least two days. Okay, last but not least, actually it's a smart energy monitoring system, as well as sensoring to monitor the energy consumption of each electrical appliances at our home. Okay, so we're also looking at other interesting or potential technology. So the, the left one is actually is a, a technology called hydro panel. It's a combination between of solar panel as well as water generator. So this particular hydro panel can actually absorb solar energy and it use that energy to actually convert humid air to uh, drinkable water. The left one actually is, the right one is the uh, typical composing toilet or flushless toilet, which actually uses less water compared to the original toilet, and also it helps to increase the circularity of grey and black water. Okay, so this actually is end of, uh, end of our presentation. Thank you for your time. And uh, for projects here, we are actually looking uh, for technology providers to actually help us to build the civilization kit. We are also open to any educational as well as outreach partner to help us in the various outreach and community projects. Thank you, and we are open to the floor for further questions. Ritika, would you like to invite everyone onto the panel? Yeah, Since if possible. Yeah, so the, the next session that we will be having during uh, this open house is a vocal stretching session. So uh, it will be a session whereby everyone will be promoted as a panelist as well. So what we can okay. do right okay. now is promote everybody as a panelist, but you don't have to show your face at the moment. Only if you want to talk and ask questions. Ritika? Yes. And Chachan. I think you mentioned that there's like some smart energy monitoring system that you guys are um, working on. Yes. Yeah. So like, I was wondering what are the challenges with actually implementing that and like, there doesn't seem to be a lot of good ones out there in the market now. Yeah. So, I was uh, just wondering why that yeah, there's a lack of traction in this area. And uh, what kind of uh, bad points that you actually heard about? <laughs> and yeah. I think like it's uh it's like not really comprehensive in terms of energy monitoring. Like, yeah, it's just okay. a very rough gauge, so it doesn't really give you much details about like how can I optimize something. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I understand. So I think for most of this uh energy monitoring system most of them actually collected not real-time data. So they actually, um, so the data or any energy consumption that being reflected is actually maybe it's already uh, seven days ago. So for such a monitoring system, um, the, we actually cannot see the, the latest data. Another thing is actually in terms of the data granular, granularity, whereby some system, the monitoring system, they only can see overall, okay, how much, energy consumption is being used for this house. But they cannot dive very deeply into uh, what is the energy consumption for each appliances. So we actually, for Ecolabs, for example, uh, we already have some startups, like for example, a Pylon City as well as Data Group. They have a very detailed and more real-time uh, energy monitoring system whereby they can actually track online and provide such interface or GUI to the, all the customer 
for them to actually to real time track what is the energy consumption of each appliances at their home. So I think that's actually the more, I would say, in thing, in thing for now. Does real-time tracking mean like we have to change our appliances all to smart devices or is it kind of like compatible with the non-smart fan or light that I have? Yeah, I think for that, they actually have a, a newer technology called smart sensors whereby they actually will be actually uh, installed at each of the, for those uh, appliances which require a much higher energy intensity. Yeah, for example, air conditioning, or maybe laundry, or your refrigerator, and so on. I see. That's cool. Thanks. Thanks. I think Pritika raised her hand. Yeah, Pritika raised her hand. Go ahead. I have a question. So, we are talking about being modular and all. So, how much carbon impact can be reduced by being modular? Will you be able to explain a little on it, Tai Chi? Okay. Uh, in terms of modularity, so when you compare conventional and also modular home, so in terms of the carbon impact, we can see in two areas. First is actually what we call it as a material carbon impact or material and body energy, which is the energy required to actually to produce that particular material. So for modular home, you can see that usually for the walls or even the slab, they are much thinner as compared to conventional homes. Secondly, most of the modular construction company, they will actually use more sustainable materials like laminated timber as compared to conventional concrete. This is the first. Secondly, we can see in terms of the construction period. So modular home actually takes lesser time to build as compared to conventional home. Uh, based on my understanding, the, the time it requires actually around 20 to 30% lesser. So this actually can contribute to a lesser construction energy. Because for on-site construction, usually we use like fuels like kerosene, or even uh, petrol, which are actually more, which is much uh, carbon intensive. So we can see in terms of the material as well as the construction aspect. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. So Jai said, what would you think would be the best material to use right now in comparison? Uh, actually, they are, there's a kind of material called green concrete promoted by Singapore Building Construction Authority or BCA. So okay. green concrete actually is a composition between um, the raw concrete plus some other recycled aggregates, which are actually used for pavement or roads or even uh, lanes. So such concrete actually, the uh, BCA actually recommend to use around 20 to 30% for a particular building structure. So this is in order to reduce the overall environmental impact. Another thing will be the laminated timber. So some buildings like in NTU, we have the latest uh, sports hall, the waste sports hall which made out of laminated timber. So based on some studies in the Europe as well in the US, they say that if you actually source your timber or laminated timber from sustainable forests, so such timber will actually account for a much lesser carbon impact. Is there one close by? Yeah, in NTU. Indonesia, I'm presuming. Oh yeah, Indonesia as well, yeah. So another factor that Ritika brought up is actually the, uh, the source of the, our material. So if we actually source it from nearby sources like in Malaysia or in Indonesia, so the transportation energy will be much lesser as compared we import from countries which are much further away. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Brian had a question, you can ask him a question. Yes, hi. Oh, Hello. Sorry. Hello. Hi, my name is Brian. Um, so I have two questions. The first one is, um, how does all of this fit in with government regulations? As in, I'm very for it. It's just that uh, I just wonder, right, where, where many things are, are tightly regulated and, and for good reason, for example, like sanitation and so on and so forth. Um, how do things like, um, yeah, all these, all these things, for example, like, I, I can't remember if it was featured, but like um, collecting rainwater, etc. how does it uh, align with covered, current government regulations? Uh, which leads into my second topic, which is something I'm really, in my second question, which is uh, what I'm very interested in, which is composting toilets, um, which is that do you guys have any um, products that you, or brands that you are currently kind of like shortlisted already? Oh, and then, sorry, and then a third one, just a passing one. I, I remember when I was reading uh, one of my level four chemistry modules on environmental chemistry or something like that, um, talking about the importance of double glazing uh, glass, right, as a form of insulation. And how basically the heat, my, my lecturer said like that's one of the most like overlooked things, even in Singapore, right? Because for the most people, we think of insulation as a way of keeping warm. 
but in Singapore where it's so so hot, right, it can actually keep us cooler as well. Um, so uh, yeah, the third one isn't a question. The first, so the two questions are basically how do all these um, um, align with and uh, with current government regulations, or are there works to change and uh, campaign for policy changes? And the second one, uh, second one is just on composting toilets. Are there any um, products that you should look at? That's a great question because that's the first thing I asked Chai Chin as well, and I knew this question would come up today. So Chai Chin's prepared. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, in terms of the regulation of policy, like for example, rainwater harvesting. So we already got uh, get in touch, got in touch with uh, the PUB uh, personnel. So they mentioned that especially for rainwater collection, rainwater is actually a property of Singapore. <laughs> So we cannot like um, go and actually collect the rainwater for our own purposes. However, for certain users, we actually need to make a particular application to PUB as well as NEA. So one of the regulations will be on in terms of the tank size that I mentioned just now, which actually you cannot collect more than 20 cubic meter. If you actually collect rainwater of more than 20 cubic meter, there will be actually a charging fee for every cubic meter of rainwater being collected. This is the first one. Secondly, it's actually for NEA. So NEA is actually looking at the, like for example, the mosquito breeding ground. So for what rainwater storage, is actually the maximum period is only seven days. Yeah. So once we actually, we for any companies or any projects that would like to employ rainwater harvesting system, so they need to make, they actually need to uh, make such application to both QV and NEA. It, they actually, there's a particular website you can refer to. And including what's your purpose, how the system layout, and so on. Yeah. So this actually are uh, the I think will be the general requirements to actually to install a rainwater harvesting system in Singapore. Yeah. And then your next question is sorry I forgot. Uh, on composting toilets, are there any uh, models that you are that currently like shortlisted or like some companies, for example? Yeah, there are some companies that we actually uh, we are looking at. So I think there's a company called Luwat from uh, UK. So they're actually using uh, uh, sort of like, they actually store the uh, black water or even human sewage in this particular toilet and use some innovative solution to solve it. Yeah. Another one is actually the grey water recycling system. Yeah. But there are actually too many uh, similar solution on grey water and black water treatment. So I think, yeah, more or less, they actually focus on uh, how do we actually uh, store such a waste and also can convert this waste into a more useful things, like for example, fertilizer and so on. Yeah. Uh, sorry. I you, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, Luwot also had another aspect where you could generate electricity from black water, which was interesting, but we're yeah. still trying to get them on board. Uh, sorry, I don't want to help the time, but just to consider, because I think a lot of the talk has been on technology, um, whereas um, something I'm very fond of is, is biological systems, right? So, I mean, there are also systems which make use of like vetiver grass, vetiver as a way of, or, or reed systems, um, riparian plants to process uh, grey and black water. So, um, in, in terms of your research, that might be something to consider also. Biological sure. systems as opposed to purely technolo technological ones. Yeah, so I don't want to hold the time. Uh, the next how, how long does that take? No idea. Oh, okay, okay. I, I don't know Maybe personally. Maybe we can take it offline idea. and then discuss. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, um, Chiruri had the question of green concrete is green, is it green compared to traditional concrete or is it green compared to other materials? Okay. Uh, green concrete is actually in comparison to the conventional concrete. So, green concrete actually consists at least 40 to 50% of recycled materials like recycled aggregates or even recycled concrete. So when actually concrete reached to the end of its life cycle, it will be actually broken down. So some of this recycled concrete will be used to make this green concrete. Yeah. So this is actually what is meant by green concrete. Okay. Then, uh, do you want to take Tyra San's question of solar panels and batteries are the core of the energy aspect of our project. Uh, we did discuss about high fuel cells and yeah. battery homes. Okay, sure. So um, I think for fuel cell, like for example, batteries, uh, typically for renewable uh, energy system, the conventional kind of battery being used is lithium or even lead acid battery. So currently the startup or the company that we are actually looking at is actually, they are using called vanadium flow battery. 
So this kind of battery have an advantage whereby it actually can, there's a, actually have a, have a huge range of capacity between five kilowatt hour to 30 kilowatt hour. So this particular battery can be actually uh, customized for a very huge range of application, as well as uh, if actually, if you intend to actually to jump from a low energy to a high energy intensity home, so such battery actually can accommodate such changes. Yeah. In terms of solar panel, maybe I can also answer Shrenway question. So we also in contact with a company that actually can uh, uses the hydro panel that I mentioned just now. So uh, such solar panel actually, uh, what I mentioned, they actually being, is being deployed at the desert in US. So um, cause desert, they're actually quite barren and actually it's a relatively open area, which actually can absorb large amount of uh, solar energy. But for desert, they actually, there's a very little uh, water sources. So for the hydro panel, it's actually, it's actually killing two birds in one stone. First is to absorb the solar energy Secondly, it actually can use that solar energy to produce drinkable water for the communities living in the desert. Yeah. And uh, from what I understand, even when you cool solar panels, their efficiency is much higher, right? Yes. So cost currently for solar cells, the maximum efficiency is only 25 to 27%. So, but currently, as solar panels actually become much cheaper. And there's currently a lot of huge investment and also huge... Um, a lot of research is being done to actually improve such efficiency. So typically for the solar panels that we are using now is actually P-type or N-type, but they are actually more uh, like uh, solar cell which are solar panels which are much have a much higher efficiency like tandem solar cell, aero sky, and so on. So these are actually uh, at the cell level, but there are still a lot of work need to be done to convert such uh, tandem or aero sky solar cell into solar module which can be deployed. Um, for industry or even commercial users. But for your use of the hydro panel in Singapore, right, does PUB have any regulations with respect to that? Like, uh, I think the only regulation... Oh, sorry? Because yeah. they are against rainwater, but then they never... I, I mean, I couldn't really find about water vapor, so I was wondering if you have any... Uh, I think for that, it's actually similar to the atmospheric water generator that I mentioned just now. So they don't have a typical, uh, how to say, rules or regulation on uh, harvesting water from humid air. They only have a regulation for rainwater collection and harvesting. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, touching uh, on Hari's question. Oh, sorry. Oh. Uh, yeah, uh, actually speaking as um, in addition to uh, our ba battery question, and uh, what, what do you think about uh, the potential of the hydrogen storage? Of course, a fuel cell use the uh, hydrogen, so in that sense, you know, maybe store the electricity with the form of the hydrogen and then using it for fuel cell or something. Uh, yeah. I don't know if that's part of the idea now, but yeah, I think hydrogen is um, to be frank. Most of the batteries that we are currently using, like for example, lead acid, lithium, actually they're using a very toxic and precious metals. So mm -hmm. this uh, material, when we actually, when we disassemble this battery for second life users or even for disposal, it can mm -hmm. create a lot of problems and require a high cost of maintenance. So uh, actually Singapore, during our recent speech early this year, so our minister actually announced that they're actually looking forward to use low carbon fuels, which include mm -hmm. hydrogen. So oh, hydrogen actually can be used for like like what um Asushi San actually mentioned like for hydrogen storage or even for hydrogen production and so on. Hmm. I see. Yeah, because hydrogen can be used for uh, maybe uh, autonomous cars and also buses and things like that. So maybe a uh, much more wider use cases can be. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Cause hydrogen is actually a much cheaper as well as a uh, yeah. accessible. Um, mm -hmm. gas, as compared to precious metal like lead or even lithium. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then back to the, you know, the quite uh, clean, you know, state. Yes, and so it's a clean right. yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Asuji. Thank you. Okay. Going to uh, Hari's question about uh, the future educational uh, collaborations that we will be having. We are working on a parametric tool to evaluate self-sustainability in Singapore and hopefully across the world with uh, Singapore Poly students that's coming up in June. So we will share that the next session. 
uh, as well as uh, YSI is our youth community partner. So we're always actively scouting for students with engineering uh, background or even non-technical backgrounds to help us co-create our prototype. So, um, Can I ask one more question? Yes, go ahead. Um, speaking about living in Westwood and being able to monitor like, our resources, I was wondering if there's, what would be the best way for us to monitor our consumption of like, water, energy, food, etc.? Uh, okay, uh, for that right, so for electricity or energy consumption, it's relatively easy. So there's already a technology which is actually the smart monitoring system, energy monitoring system. For showering, so when I was actually a part of an environmental organization back in uni, so uh, they actually already have technologies to actually mo uh, monitor water, in which we actually install sensors like for example at the show showering head or at the uh, inlet for the laundry itself. So we actually can monitor the water's consumption from there. Yeah. So this... Is it, uh, is it, quite, is it cheap? Uh, okay. It's quite cheap for sensors nowadays. Okay. Especially for electricity. Okay. You were also sharing there's apps that you can do use, right? Yeah. For some apps, they actually can be able to track your, like for example, your carbon footprint in terms of electricity or water. But some of these apps actually requires a manual input. Like for example, you need to know how many kilo hours of electricity being used or how many liters of water that you actually is consumed that day. Then you need to input those data in the app itself. So it's actually relatively manual and not, uh, not automatic. Yeah. So these are, I think these are some of the barriers that I think for future research, they actually can look into. Do you have an estimate on the cost of one of the sensors? <laughs> Uh, Will you guys be able to propose a plan that we can put into Westwood? Uh, yeah, definitely there's a lot of uh, existing market solution or yeah. even some innovative solution from startups. Because, you know, for, from Ecolab perspective, we already have some quite innovative solution from Ecolab startup that actually may, can actually cater some solution to the Westwood side or, yeah. Yeah, so... Yeah, so sure, we, we can we can get in touch with you. You can be our test bed. Yes, yes. Exactly. that's what I'm thinking. Like, I'm thinking that since we have like inhabitants, we have yes. a house, then like we can both create like data for Westwood as well as for us. We want to minimize our consumption. Yeah, yeah. You can be our baseline, and yeah. then we can see. Yeah, yeah. Because and we were planning to do baselining in our prototype as well, so we can. Yeah. It's good to be we got our utility view, so that like, we can see how much we consume in in a month, but. It doesn't tell us like our patterns of consumption or like how we should lower it. Yeah. Yeah. And I would love to hear from your startups, like uh, the Ecolab startups and technologies you guys would want to investigate into because then like we would be the perfect people to try it out. Sure. Okay. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, thank you everybody. I think we, um, thank you for joining us. And uh, you can go, go to our website, projectshia.com. Uh, and get in touch with us if you have any questions or would like to contribute to our project. So over to you, Jaden. Thanks.